Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Anal fissure is one of the most common condition which one out of 10 people suffer in their lifetime sometime. So it's very important for a general surgeon to know how to diagnose and how to manage anal fissure. A lot of patients we see in the OPD who are mismanaged. Many of the anal fissure patients are on antibiotics, unnecessary medications, and um, sometimes surgery is not properly done. And we have today Dr. Mahesh Chanapa, who is senior consultant at Astro CMI Hospital. He will enlighten us on anal fissure. I'm sure postgraduates are very happy today. They need not worry too much about presentation or anything. They can quietly listen to that and ask all their doubts and questions whenever the time comes. Thank you all. Dr. Mahesh, you can start. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for the brief intro. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, my colleagues and uh, all the postgraduates who are uh, present today. Uh, there's been heavy rain and uh, I hope everyone are safe at home. Uh, anal fissure, uh, sir said, uh, is a very common erectile uh, condition. Though the exact etiology is debatable, there is a clear association with the elevated internal anal spinter. Though hard bowel movements are implicated in fissures, but it's not so in most of the fissures. So let us see, you know, uh, the course of the presentation, how things would evolve and uh, how we can get answer for most of your questions. And as Sir said, this is the commonest problem one, uh, you know, a surgeon, a general or a GA surgeon would see in his outpatient every day. So let us uh, begin with a, a brief introduction. So what is an anal fissure? An anal fissure is a split in the skin of the distal anal canal, which is characterized by a severe pain on defecation and associated with bleeding occasionally or most of the times. It can also be an elongated ulcer in the long axis of the lower anal canal. It is a common condition of middle and younger age group. It is second most to J complication following uh, hemorrhoids during pregnancy. It was first described by John Perry Lockhart Memory from United Kingdom uh, who is actually also devised uh, uh, a classification of colorectal, colorectal cancer, which precedes Duke's classification. Most of the times, the typical pain is described as like passing broken glasses and which lasts for an hour or two to three hours following the act of defecation. Uh, it causes a huge uh, social and economic implication especially in the present day world where most of the enters are working from home or the software engineers because it has been found that uh, fissure is usually found commonly in uh, patients uh, who have a sedentary lifestyle and altered diets. So it has got a negative effect on the quality of life and psychological issues. This is what a typical uh, cute fissure would look like, as I explained earlier, like a teardrop sign. You can see in the first uh, picture, and this is a pictorial representation. Most of the time, a fissure is presented along with a sentinel pile. A sentinel pile is a, like a, a shield which sits in front of the fissure, and it usually enlarges during an acute fissure. So coming to the etiology of the fissure. So what causes the fissure? As I mentioned earlier, passage of hard stools or a bolus of a hard stool may precipitate an acute anal fissure. However, minority of the patients are only, are, only minority of the patients are constipated at the onset of symptoms. We have also seen fissures in patients who have recurrent episodes of loose tools. Also secondary to trauma caused by anorectal surgeries or anorectal anoreceptive intercourse. It is also found secondary to especially orthopedic surgeries wherein patients are 
given very high dose of opiate analgesics, usually it presents with small amount of fresh blood as patients explain. It could be a streak of blood or if somebody is using the tissue, some staining of the blood with the tissue paper. Uh, further going forward with the etiology and the reason, uh, why there is a fissure in the midline posteriorly most commonly found? It is not completely understood, but there is one uh, theory or explanation. Uh, the probable explanation would be the posterior wall of the rectum takes a steep curve and it joins the hollow of the sacrum down in the anal canal and there is a sharp backward turn and this area can constrict the bowel the bolus of the feces movement and can lead to constipation. Due to this anatomical nature, there has always been a debate about using Western compared to the Indian toilet. There has been enough studies which says that in the Indian toilet, when an individual squats, this position can straighten up, preventing the pressure on the erectile junction, leading to less problems of fissure and that's how uh, fissures are most commonly found in the, in the, even in the literature, in the Western literature than in the Indian literature. And during defecation, there is an undue stretch of the overlying epithelium. Sometimes it can also happen following an incorrectly performed hemorrhoid surgery, wherein too much of skin is removed, which can result in stenosis or stricture leading to a fissure formation. Do you have any questions here, anybody? Mm, Hello, okay, can anybody? Yeah, Dr. Ravi Shankar is asking, where is anterior, where is anterior fissure common? I am going to that, sir. Like uh, it is just the etiology I presented. Uh, we come to that uh, the position of the fissure anterior, posterior, lateral. I'm going to. Common, you are going to tell, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, sir. As I proceed, I will talk about it, sir. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Right. Carry on, my. Yeah. Uh, pathophysiology, as you can see in the chart. Uh, any trauma, a micro trauma, as I mentioned earlier, caused by the hard feces, the nature of the anatomy itself, or surgery can lead to a ischemic ulcer or a wound which has got low blood supply. And this leads to severe pain, causing the spasm of the internal anal splinter. Cadaveric studies have shown that the blood supply to this, to the anal canal, shows poor circulation in the posterior midline of the anal canal wherein the fissures are more common. The blood supply is further reduced by spasm of the internal splinter. And then when there is a tear in the anal skin, there is no sufficient blood supply to heal the split skin, leading to a vicious cycle of pain, bleeding, and wound, which takes a longer time to heal. Uh, there are various classifications classifications for the anal fissures. A simple classification could be acute, chronic, and atypical fissures. An acute fissure is, as I mentioned, a tear of a paper-like split skin uh, distal to the anal canal. Many anterior fissures heal spontaneously by one to two weeks. Chronic fissures are fissures which persist for longer than six weeks after showing other morphological features such as indurated edges, with a skin tag, and sometimes the internal anal splinter fibers are visible at the base of the ulcer. The atypical fissures or fissures, which are which comprises less than one percent, which are located off the midline laterally, I would say. Yeah. Uh, coming to the history and examination, usually patient present with the typical pain lasting for an hour or sometime up to three hours following defecation. Most of the patients, when they come to your OPD are very scared and apprehensive. First thing you have to do is to reassure them. There can be a past history of anorectal trauma and obstetric history also helps to know what is happening. 
patients who had a histiotomy, normal delivery can have tear in the uh, rectal mucosa leading to acute or chronic fissures. A history of chronic diarrhea is also important in dealing with a patient with fissure. Uh, sometimes a chronic fissure, patients can present with mild serious discharge with itching, which can also be in favor of a fissure. What are the key diagnostic factors? As again, I mentioned earlier, the risk factor, the commonest risk factor is heart stools. Then usually in pregnancy, it occurs in third trimester or after delivery. A tearing sensation while passing stools is found in around 60% of the patients. The nature of blood is also important. Usually the blood in fissures is bright blood and is like streaks. Uh, it's very minimal blood. Sometimes in a chronic larger fissure, there can be drops of blood, but it usually appears like fresh bright blood appears from a wound. There can be severe anal spasm in most of the acute fissures. Sometimes there can be waxing and waning of symptoms. Sentinel pile is reported in 20% of the cases. And these fissures can be visible by gentle retraction of the buttock in nearly 40 to 50% of the patients. The, a digital examination should be delayed and should not be attempted in the first visit or at least to know exactly what is happening. Otherwise, patients can lose confidence in you. So we should take time, a thorough counseling and examine them gently. If in doubt, an examination and anesthesia should always be conducted. We should be wary about old patients because it's very uh, uncommon in older patients to have a diagnosis of fissure because it is not always fissure. There can be an underlying uh, low rectal cancer or any other problem happening in that region. So we should be careful while diagnosing a fissure in older patients. Coming to the characteristics of fissure, as I mentioned, gentle parting of the buttocks, you can see the, uh, you know, the tip of the, the edge of the fissure and marked spasm of the anus. Sometimes you can see inner skin tags at the anal verge. After slightly parting the buttocks, the lower end of the fissure can be seen as a linear split or like a tear-shaped ulcer, which we have seen earlier. Sometimes a fissure can just resemble like a paper cut. A wider indurated edges and visible transverse fibers of the internal splinter at the base can be seen. Uh, posterior, in males, the posterior midline is very common, especially around 90%, whereas in females, it is up to 60%. Uh, in females, the rest of them are anterior fissures. Uh, commonly seen in middle and younger age group, uh, one of the studies, the mean age group was found to be around 39.9 40 years. As I mentioned earlier, the lateral fissures are rare, less than 1%. Whenever you come across a lateral fissure, other systemic disorders like Crohn's, tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, uh, patients uh, with uh, HIV and renal cancer should be kept, mind, kept in mind and a thorough investigation has to be undertaken before finally concluding it as fissure. As I mentioned earlier, this is just a diagrammatic uh, representation of the common areas of fissure. The male city is most commonly a posterior fissure. In females, around 60% will have posterior and rest of them are anterior fissures. Any questions here, sir? Yes, Mahesh, we'll take some questions. Okay, this is to postgraduates. Why anal fissure is very, very painful? Anybody? Dr. Ritika? Good evening, sir. Yeah. Sir, this is beyond the dentate line, sir. So there, it will be supplied by the parietal nerve, sir. So it is painful, sir. Beyond means you mean... Proximal or distal? So distal to the dentate line, sir. Yes. So it's a skin. That's why it's very, very painful. 
So yes, sir. Above the dentate line, it will not be painful. Somatic nerves yes, supply, and the yeah. Next is okay. Next, anybody? What is internal sphincter? The continuation of circular muscle fiber, sir. Continuation of circular muscle fiber from the rectum. Continuation of the distal part of the continuation of the smooth muscle fibers of the rectum, right? Yes, sir. Because these two are very, very important for fissure. Yes, sir. So, Dr. Mahesh already told the most important thing to diagnose fissure. How do you diagnose fissure? By? Retracting the buttocks, sir, by inspection mostly. Inspection, yeah, it's not a palpation, it's not a proctoscopy diagnosis, it is not the finger examination, it is by inspection. Yeah. Gentle okay. parting of the buttocks. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ravishankar, you have any questions you want to discuss? No, I, I just put it up for the postgraduates. Why anterior fissures are more common in women compared to men? Right. I think Mahesh explained that. No? Dr. Sri, yes, Dr. Sri Ram, thank you for joining. Yeah, pudendal nerves supplying there, right. Uh, is it Crohn's common in um, this fissure, Dr. Mahesh? Uh, the other way, sir, like in Crohn's disease, fissures can occur. Uh, so that uh, it is not common, but yes, when there is, uh, you know, fissures and if there are any abdominal symptoms or uh, GI symptoms, we should be, uh, we should thoroughly evaluate or have a previous history of Crohn's should be evaluated. But it's mainly the association with fistulas. Fistulas, yes, sir. Right, right. But if you see, you know, uh, multiple fissures, right, multiple chronic fissures, or sometimes even anterior fissures, you should, uh, especially in men, you should be worried whether there is anything other than a, just a standard fissure. So then you yes, can sir, use for Crohn's also. That's true. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Continue, Mahesh. Anterior and even lateral fissures. Yeah. Yes, Thank you. Uh, Mahesh, sir, can I come in? Yeah, 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 Dr. Tell me, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, I was uh, just talking about the history. Can't hear you, Dr. Ravi Shankar. Can't hear you, Dr. King, okay. This uh, bleeding PR, the stool column that is one. Second thing is uh, pain. Pain is more with uh, fissure and not with hemorrhoids. Uh, that, that's how we take history taking to differentiate between hemorrhoids and fissures. Sir, am I correct? Yes, sir. I usually take it this way. And usually when the patient comes to OPD, their pr more problematic symptoms, they would say first. So if they say, talking about uh, mm -hmm. bleeding, and then most of the time it is hemorrhoids. If they say that, you know, like they have severe pain, and then when we ask, they say occasional bleeding, uh, it could be fissure most of the time. I think it's a very, very important uh, thing Dr. Noli brought up. Yes, sir. Hemorrhoids are not painful unless they are complicated, like a thrombosed hemorrhoids that can be painful. Correct. Correct. Otherwise, when a patient comes with pain in the anal region, the first thing you yes, think sir. of is fissure in anal. If the patient says there is more bleeding without pain, painless bleeding, then you think of more of hemorrhoids. Correct, sir, Dr. Noli? Hemorrhoids. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Ravi Shankar, you have anything to add? Uh, Mahesh said... Yes, uh, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mahesh said, uh, which is broadly correct, that, uh, you know, fissures are usually a diagnosis of, you know, inspection and rectal examination should be tried, you know, avoided if possible or to be done gently. We, I agree with that statement. Delayed all. Yeah. Yes, sir. 
once only thing is if you, if for example it is not an obvious fissure but the patient has significant amount of pain a submucous uh, perianal abscess may also be one of the differential diagnosis so in that situation yes, a examination is necessary so but i agree with you that with the tenet that it has to be done very gently and you know should not jump to doing a correct examination maybe put some local anesthetic gel and then examine later otherwise uh, surgeon may get a nice kick yeah. oh. correct yeah. <laughs> yeah most of the papers uh, mention it as uh, a delayed examination they would mention sir yeah. yeah yeah certainly don't even think about doing a proctoscopy yes sir definitely yeah. shall i proceed sir right right yeah there is one more question i'll let me check dr sheena <clears throat> please come in you only ask we want you all to participate uh, sir i meant to ask that uh, i have seen a few patients uh, who's uh, who have come with pain uh, painful hemorrhoids but who, i mean it's not thrombosed in those cases so is it necessary that only a thrombosed hemorrhoid uh, will cause pain or can it be otherwise as well thrombosed and then prolapsed if yeah. outside then if there is infection any other condition mahesh or if they are associated with fissure or an yeah, uh... yes mahesh and also i was uh, going through a paper it's uh, very difficult to take it out of the my hello yes yes continue hello can i hear sir yeah yeah, yeah. continue yeah also uh, it is mentioned in some some of the papers that uh, it is very difficult to take it out of the mind from the patient uh, to tell them that it is not hemorrhoids it is fissure most of the time they come with a prefix in their mind that thinking that it is hemorrhoid and we have to take a thorough history and convince them that it is fissure uh, so during the history and examination time because most of the time any problem in that region for the patient it is piles or hemorrhoids yes and hemorrhoid which is uh, not need not be thrombosed which is a prolapsed hemorrhoid uh, staying outside for a long time can lead to pain due to edema and obstruction so that can also present with pain i think uh, dr sheena i think main thing is uh, you know here it is a distinction between fissure and hemorrhoids so hemorrhoids does not usually present with pain it is mainly bleeding on the other hand fissure is mainly pain rather than bleeding so that was the distinction in medicine nothing is 100% yes, so there will always be patients who have some pain in the hemorrhoids right continue mahesh thank you sir uh, so once uh, a detailed history has been taken and uh, you are very sure that uh, it is fissure uh, they, you may not require any diagnostic test a non painful clinical examination should be enough to make a, uh, a good diagnosis of fissure especially in the young and middle age group uh, but uh, in literature uh, it suggests that especially in women who had a previous obstetric history they come with a fissure an anal monometric study is mandatory or is necessary before we decide about surgery to check the integrity of the spinter muscles because we don't want to do a surgery or a spintrotomy to a patient who already have some deficient external spinter following a bad obstetric uh, sequelae there is also a recommendation about uh, trans anal ultrasound examination as an adjunct for your diagnosis wherever necessary if there is already a spinter deficit a damage of spinter should not be attempted trans rectal ultrasound is also must in recurrent fissures or especially when patient says that they have already undergone a surgery for fissure to see the integrity of the internal layer splinter a transrectal ultrasound is a important adjunct which should be conducted before offering surgery to such patients yeah as uh, dr shankar was mentioning there are various differential diagnoses when it comes to pain in the anus or rectum Uh, should be very especially as i mentioned earlier elderly patients carcinoma of the anus should be kept in mind when a patient presents with 
multiple fissures, we should always suspect other causes of fissure and indirect cause like pruritus, homosexual practice or insertion of sex toys should also be kept in mind. Other problems in the region which are akin or similar to the anal fissure or condylomas and abscess can be presenting with severe pain wherein you're not able to make a thorough examination. A fistula also be kept in mind. Anal chancre, a painful ulcer with discharge wherein the discharge fluid can be subjected to microscopic examination. Tubercular ulcers can also present as fissures. Classic characteristic is undermined edges. Uh, one more thing to remember is proctalgia fugax, uh, which can be distinguished from fissure with the history itself, wherein in proctalgic fugax, the pain is severe episodic pain, often, often occurs in night, and is found more commonly in very stressed and anxious patients. So these are the important differential diagnosis we should keep in our mind while examining a patient in the outpatient. So a thorough clinical history is very important in all the patients before concluding it as a fissure. So wherever necessary, an examination of anesthesia has to be conducted. If there are abnormal skin tags, they have to be biopsied. If there are fluid, which is you know, doubtful, should be cultured in all those cases which I mentioned above. Most of the fissures heal spontaneously up to 60% heal by six to eight weeks. 20% will heal by topical application of diltism or nitrites. Some may relapse. Relapse around 30% of these patients may require surgery. But uh, going by most of the papers, there is a medium qualitative evidence that the surgery that is uh, lateral internal spintrotomy is more effective than most of the modalities. So coming to the treatment aspect, uh, before that, I, if there are any questions, I would like to take the questions. Yes, Mahesh, anybody has? Uh, uh, sir, can I come in? Yeah, yeah. Tell me, sir. Yeah, sir, most of the time, these people of Fisher or hemorrhoids for that matter, uh, they usually have already taken treatments elsewhere, outside, okay? by yes. some yes. of the practitioners or by quacks and uh, at the last resort only they come to us all these uh, ointments everything sometimes they have applied uh, many other medicines also like ayurvedic or something okay so i think uh, i don't know i want to ask your opinion uh, should we go ahead with, with um, again applying these ointments or we should go ahead with the surgery by the time they come to us it will be always the chronic pressure sir Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, like I usually see such patients in the OPD, but since uh, I am seeing them for the first time, if their pain is uh, uh, not so severe, I would still try uh, using a conservative approach until unless the patient is in agony and they are willing to go ahead with the surgery. So I would give a, at least a 48 hours time with the conservative approach with uh, uh, thorough counseling, lifestyle modification, uh, then, you know, like local uh, ointments and reassure them and see them after 48 hours. But uh, as you mentioned, if they've already tried similar medicines and they opt for surgery, we'll go ahead with the surgery. Sir, sir among the various ointments, uh, they have come in the market. Uh, which do you prefer, sir? I am coming to that, sir. Like, okay, uh, okay, okay, it's coming okay. up. Okay. I'm presenting we'll about those that. things. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, Doctor uh, Ravi, <clears throat> what is ARM you are talking about? Why ARM in women? In erectile manometry, sir. So, this is a question to the postgraduates. Okay. Okay. Uh, Doctor uh, uh, Mahesh uh, said that in erectile manometry should be done in uh, women. So, any of the postgraduates can they answer this question? Yeah. Please, final year postgraduates at least, they should answer. Sir, to check the resting anal uh, pressure, sir, which is because of uh, internal sphincter muscle. As sir said, obstetric injuries may cause uh, the damage to internal sphincter. 
so to okay. achieve integrity so, of internal but security. why in women so you should actually do it in both men and women also no so why only specifically women not sure sir anybody else hari ajit sir uh, during uh, childbirth um, there will be injury to the anal sphincter so um, we should check for this uh, in case of fissure sir no, but in sphinx in spinsters then there is no childbirth so um so i'm not really sure sir see the you know the resting anal sphincter tone is about 20 15 to 20% less in women compared to men and even the sphincter length is about you know in men it is about 2.5 to 4.5 cm and in women it is 1.5 to 2.5 cm so both in terms of the resting sphincter tone and also the sphincter length women are inferior to men though they won't admit it so that is why uh, it is important to, uh, to do anorectal manometry in women especially because in men it may not be necessary you know i think as dr mahesh has very clearly stated clinical examination has the best ability to discern whether anything else is required because if you do the examination if the sphincter tone is either high or normal you don't have to worry in patients who have sphincter tone which is suboptimal or subnormal then you have to be very careful should never even think about offering lateral sphincterotomy yes sir yes sir yeah while we are here ravi shankar let us finish off another question yeah why this fissure you see in lot of patients who have recently delivered why it's more common after delivery post graduates sir Many? my wife is gynecologist can i come in sir <laughs> Not you, sir. You know the answer. You don't have to come in. <laughs> you are the chief gynecologist, sir. <laughs> PG, please volunteer to answer these questions. It is for your sake. All these questions. Sir, uh, maybe because a child was uh, at uh, the child was because of pushing and straining. Your happened. voice is breaking. Can you hear me now, sir? Yeah, yeah. Go, Ari. Sir. Uh, so during childbirth so because of the pushing and straining happens so increased pressure that is put on the muscle sometimes causes pressure mm -hmm. sir no no sir you only come for rescue <laughs> uh, no uh, this is uh, true sir this is uh, usually while giving labor pains uh, there is injury to the uh, anal canal sir most of the time especially in primary in spite of giving uh, episiotomy we do come across post operatively they will be having chronic fissure in anus sir uh, and usually they heal by a uh, conservative treatment no need for surgery sir right right also there sir, is a... can, can i make an info yeah i heard you ravi shankar you ready sir complete maadi na i will come back after you so for diet modification occurs after pregnancy lot of people will be starving they don't take enough of fluid there is lot of constipation also because of that also lot of patients suffer after delivery uh, with fissure many times it's very acute fissure and very very painful and many times as dr noli said uh, with conservative treatment may disappear very few of them require surgery Yes, what causes iron, sir? One causes iron, sir. Yeah, iron, iron tablets. Iron tablets, which causes constipation. Correct. See the the debate between you know this is slightly off the track, but the debate between you know cesarean section and so-called normal delivery. I think you know with normal delivery you have acute hemorrhoids, acute fissure, and perineal yes, tears. All these things will happen, and that is. acute and that happens but what which is not you know discussed is that there is an element of immunogenic uh, injury to the vasa nervorum of the perineal and the pudendal nerves so such patients who have had so called normal deliveries in their 50 for late 40s 50s and 60s will develop incontinence so that that is another important aspect that one has to remember agree ravi that's uh, one mahesh 
that's why when we do lateral sphincterotomy or fissure treatment in women we have to be very very cautious many of them after yeah. late 50s 60s they may develop incontinence correct that's very very important yeah yes mahesh yeah one more thing uh, theory is like uh, because of the uh, womb the inorectal angle become further acute leading to a uh, problem of uh, movement in the inorectal region so usually they are uh, during the pregnancy or in third trimester they will have constipation leading to uh, mild fissures or subclinical fissures which can actually present later due to diet modification post delivery so whether they have undergone c section or a normal delivery it is common following the delivery to have uh, fissures or hemorrhoids sir correct right dr hanmantaya please come in we need your guidance dr hanmantaya can you unmute he is asking why fissure is common in pregnant ladies dr vanita has Uh, explained calcium also causes constipation apart from iron i am not very sure ravi and i am not sure that calcium causes uh, constipation dr nooli sir no sir calcium doesn't sir more often it is iron only sir yeah i think so i dr vanita sir uh, i have read like internal anal sphincter physiology sir like uh, sphincter uh, tone is maintained by influx of uh, calcium through calcium channels sir okay i think this is a point we have to read a little more and that here you are to hello sir internal anal sphincter tone is maintained by influx of calcium through calcium channels and i have read sir in uh, physiology okay just give clarity okay vanita while you are on the subject of physiology yes sir how much does the internal sphincter contribute to the anal continence sir that i am not sure sir 60 to 70 percent the physiology you should have told me the answer to that <laughs> <laughs> dr ravi you only clarify that yeah see the resting anal the anal sphincter tone 90% of the sphincter tone is contributed by the internal anal sphincter and 10% by the external sphincter which is in under voluntary control so the internal sphincter is and you know it is uh, not in your control because it is uh, controlled by the sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers so um, 10% is only in your control which is why you don't uh, pass motions or become incontinent even at night when you are you know not uh, completely in control of your consciousness yeah when there is a chronic fissure the internal sphincter goes into chronic uh, spasm yeah it causes lot of uh, like a start, sort of stenosis i think that's why it's very important lateral sphincterotomy which relieves that spasm and that's how it, the fissure heals heals so, correct uh, mahesh will explain that shall we go to the next mahesh carry on yes sir thank you sir Uh, coming to the treatment uh, operative and non operative we'll first uh, discuss about the non operative management majority of the acute fissures resolve without surgery or intervention when chronic fissure develops healing is more difficult to achieve the goal of non operative therapy should be uh, straight forward and consist of three components that is one is removing the underlying pathology relaxation of the internal sphincter to improve the blood supply to the fissure to heal and reducing the symptoms that is bleeding and pain the american college society of colon and rectal surgeons have recommended sitz bath fiber rich diet and increased fluid intake along with topical application which improves the uh, healing uh, process of the fissure and as i mentioned majority of them can heal with conservative approach uh the treatment approach should be a rapid and effective symptom relief for the patient at the same time 
the cause should be identified and the known other causes should be eliminated. Uh, there, there is no much change in treatment, that is, especially the medical management for both acute and chronic. So the initial treatment would involve a conservative approach, which involves high fiber diet. When come to, coming to high fiber diet, various studies have been conducted and it is proven that the high fiber diet definitely helps to improve the symptoms of fissure, increase fluid intake, sits bath, use of stool softness, also along with non-opiate analgesics. Uh, topical nitrates and calcium channel blockers have been recommended. I will come to the details of in the further slides. Treatment of topical diltism is popular than nitrate because the nitrates uh, causes a dose limiting headaches, which actually encourages the patients to discontinue the treatment in between. So their compliance with nitrate is lesser compared to the diltism. So uh, topical Mahesh, we are lost. Dr. Mahesh. Somebody muted him. Vanita. Sir, uh, sir, only muted, I think, sir. Sir is uh, there, sir. Must have uh, place. Yes, sir. Can you unmute him? Can't do that. Uh, Mahesh? I will try, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes. Yeah, yeah, you can. You had muted yourself. Yeah, go back. Yeah. Uh, as I was mentioning, uh, topical diltism is more popular than the nitrates because the nitrates can be discontinued by the patients themselves, wherein they, they, they may develop dose limiting headaches. So most of the studies or uh, most of the practitioners prefer diltism over nitrates. One more thing. Yeah, again, Mahesh. The patient. Sorry. Vanita. Yes, sir. He stopped sharing the uh, yes, sir. presentation also. Can you just? I will uh, try, sir. Mahesh. Sir. Your presentation is also not coming. No, the co-host has unmuted, sir. Unmuted and... Oh, Anita. It says the, the co-host has unmuted your uh, video, uh, muted your video. Can you change it, Anita? Change it, sir. Yeah, now you share, Mahesh. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Again, sir. Share the presentation. Sir. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Again, sir. Share the presentation. Sir. Yeah, meantime, if there are any questions, shall we take? What is high fiber diet in India? Give example, asked by Dr. Nodi. Anybody wants to answer? Dr. Pawan? What is high fiber diet? Dr. Hari? Uh, sir, uh, more of uh, vegetables, high fiber cereals, and uh, um, like beans, vegetables, like that, sir. Right. What else? Aishwarya, fruits, vegetables, green leafy vegetables. Anything else? Unpolished rice. Unpolished rice, right. Like, uh, 
yes the brown rice instead of white rice right anything else sir ragi millets they right. are high fiber banana fruits sir fruits all fruits all green leaf leafy vegetables salads millets anything else sir dr noli no sir the that's that's enough sir yeah okay mahesh you are on now you are yes presentation is on yeah okay sir so as i was mentioning uh, the topical treatment should be continued for a um, minimum of 6 to 8 weeks that is because the epithelialization of the fissure will be happening if a uh, patient stop treatment in between they can develop a new fissure and uh, it can actually considered as a failure of treatment and uh, they may have problems and you know like uh, they can come back with a new fissure or new symptoms yeah so uh, coming to the important thing which we all advise to all our patients with fissure or any conditions in the uh, perineum or urethral region is the sitz bath sitz bath has been used since centuries for uh, most of the perineal problems uh, it is definitely has got uh, proven benefits for fissures uh, how means like it improves the hygiene decreases the pain and decreases the tone of the anal canal Dodi and et al have done a uh, thorough study with a good number of patients wherein the benefit of warm water at around 40 degree centigrade is found to have to be helpful when the resting anal pressure decreases significantly from baseline and uh, it remains unchanged at 5 and 23 degree centigrade so sitz bath is uh, very effective uh, in between there were some papers which actually doubted the utilization or usefulness of the sitz bath but uh, there are uh, more papers supporting uh, sitz bath for not only fissures uh, various uh, perineal issues like hemorrhoids fistulas post delivery uh, post episiotomy it has helped uh, in various studies and it has got a good strength compared to people who don't believe in sitz bath uh coming to the individual drugs topical applications which are used topical nitrates uh nitric oxide is a predominant uh, non adrenergic non cholinergic neurotransmitter in the internal sphincter it relaxes the sphincter and improves the blood supply it is available as uh, glyceryl trinitrite 0.2% when applied twice daily for 8 weeks it gives a lot of symptom relief and help the fissure to heal the main drawback with this is uh, intolerance due to side effects and poor patient compliance uh, due to systemic absorption which leads to vasodilation and severe headaches most of the time as uh, i mentioned earlier 20 to 25% of the patients may discontinue the treatment and that can lead to relapse or leading to chronic fissures when coming when using topical nitrates uh calcium channel blockers uh, it is uh, diltezem and uh, they can be taken orally or topically but uh, without associated headache oral nifedipine has been tried at a dose of uh, 20 mg twice daily uh, topical calcium channel blockers are acceptable choice for chronic anal fissure it helps uh, in healing most of the fissures with minimal side effects the only side effect uh, with calcium channel blockers is uh, itching but once counseled thoroughly the complex is better than the nitrate so for dr uh, uh, nulis uh, question uh, most of the papers are uh, are i would recommend glyceryl uh, trinitrate that is calcium channel blocker local applicate topical applicants then the uh, then the glyceryl nitrates the diltezem is preferred because of the compliance of patients Uh, one more drug uh, which is uh, uh, used most commonly in the western countries rather than in india is the botulinum toxin it is an exotoxin produced by bacterium clostridium botulinum it is injected locally when it injected binds to the presynaptic nerve terminals at the neuromuscular junction 
which release which prevents the release of acetylcholine resulting in temporary muscle paralysis uh, but uh, various uh, studies have shown some side effects when get absorbed systemically leading to increased urinary residual volume can cause heart block can cause skin allergies can also change in heart rate and blood pressure sometimes temporary incontinence to flatters and stools and also once the effect is gone there is a high chance of recurrence of fissure since there are more side effects it is not practiced uh, often compared to the other local uh, you know conservative modalities uh, there is medium quality evidence then internal internal spirotomy in more uh, is more effective than topical nitrates and calcium channel blocker there is a high quality evidence compared to bottling them that surgery is more uh, efficient or effective an rct of uh, uh, 99 patients showed that there is overall healing rate of uh, 65% of the patients in the bottling and toxic injection compared to uh, uh, later enteral spirotomy a uh, problem with bottling is there is no consensus on dosage some studies have recommended dosage ranging between 20 to 100 units in small volume of saline injected directly into the internal sphincter uh, but uh, not many uh, surgeons uh, practice uh, use of bottling them the most preferred is the uh, diltiazem cream and then the GT, uh, glycerol trinitrate cream any questions here sir yes i think we'll take questions yeah who has maximum experience with non operative treatment anybody seniors dr ravi what's your experience Sir, the um, when I went to England, there was about twenty to twenty-five cases in a week for uh, lateral sphincterotomy. When I was returning ten to twelve years later, there hardly used to be any cases. So significantly, once uh, in, after GTN and then now diltiazem, there is a uh, about eighty um, to ninety percent reduction in the number of surgeries we perform for. Uh, Fisher, Fisher, and uh, I think the main thing is with the diltiazem, the patients have to be properly educated that they have to apply the diltiazem into the you know, anal canal rectum with a gloved finger rather than just applying it outside because most people do that. So unless you educate them, they will never be able to you know if they are not compliant with this treatment, then it is bound to fail. If it is applied properly and the patients are counselled properly. About eighty-five to ninety percent of them will heal, and we only do surgery in patients who have recurred on one or two uh, episodes of conservative treatment. That's excellent. Uh, I never had such success rate. Doctor Gurshantapa, what's your experience? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, this uh, uh, somehow I personally believe this uh, medical or non-surgical treatment. is very effective if the fissure is only acute acute once it becomes chronic whatever the modalities other than the surgical intervention which mentioned in the presentation probably may not have a complete relief and uh, over that along with the medical treatment for acute fissure the bowel habits uh, like exactly telling them what they need to do uh, yeah. like having a regular bowel habits food things so that together probably will prevent those patients to go for a chronic entity so but once the diagnosis is chronic probably nothing other than surgery will be more effective in the management right right your my my answer is the same you know that it is only effective in acute fissures not chronic in right. chronic fissures the figures fall to about 45 to 50% if you if patients insist on three you know on a medical management you have to warn them that it is only effective in about half of them compared to about 85 to 90 in acute right i think that's a very important distinguishing so shuram yes shuram yes. Uh, that is why my practice is uh, even though it looks a very small entity and uh, it needs uh, we should glove and then need to examine nicely we think that it is not a big problem even in uh, practice Uh, but uh, if we can classify them in the first uh, the consultation itself and uh, speak to them what exactly is the disease what is your final opinion 
probably that will fetch more benefits to the patient and to our practice and we'll be defining what exactly the pathology is right right but um, both of you i want to ask you say patient has come with very severe pain so if you tell them that you apply the G, what is uh, diltiazem inside many of them not able to put inside so what i do is i first few one or two three days i tell them to apply a uh, lignocaine jelly correct and pain gets relieved they become more comfortable and then start using the diltiazem ointment once that acute spasm comes down pain gets relieved after six months everything then i feel the acute fissures healing chances are much better with diltiazem in acute cases your opinion please absolutely you are absolutely right i think the locks or lignocaine 2% gel should be applied ad libitum they should tell them you should tell them you can apply it as many times as you want whenever you have pain and usually diltiazem is applied after they have had the bubble movement and sits bath so they will be a bit more comfortable then you apply so i think that way you you are very right that it is very painful but after the first two or three days the pain will come down significantly correct correct okay. uh shall i yeah please yeah uh Uh, irrespective of the intelligence of the patient whether intel uh, educated uneducated the applications of whatever the form whenever there is a acute pain literally they will fail uh, only in the consultation one of us like only in the first instance if it is available if they have brought or if we have with us only one application can be done by us by us only with difficulty so best way of relieving that acute pain till they start applying that is having a nice good frequent sits bath and maybe some some muscle relaxants so that that will give their confidence of uh, getting relieved of pain and then probably they will be able to use this local application in the acute phase of the disease even if you just prescribe and describe them how exactly it should be applied most of them they fail in uh, the way it has to be applied because there is pain and which is not seen Correct. which is not seen Correct. so it is a sits bath and maybe a good muscle relaxant analgesics and laxatives to get the confidence in the beginning and later they need to i insist of application of this diltiazem or the relaxants maybe once in the night and not just before they pass the stools maybe in the night and the next dose in the morning uh, with the sits bath directly when there is acute pain if they tell you like tell them to apply literally they fail because one is they are scared to put where there is pain which is not seen and second it is difficult it is not so easy like what we explain them with that uh, big thing they think that it is a big event that knob uh, which we <laughs> show them uh, probably they are scared so this is how i practice uh, whenever the patient come to me yeah dr gurshant do you use oral muscle relaxants or only local a uh, oral muscle relaxants i give it for initial if it is a acute uh, thing uh, for 3 uh, days uh, let them have with a laxative with sits bath sits bath i ask them to have more frequently right. so oral muscle relaxants i have never used uh, anybody else ravi you have used no no i haven't used it yeah uh, it uh, it is uh, i'm i don't know because dr nuli sir you are experienced Th- uh, thiopolchicin uh, will help you ram thiopolchicin with uh, pa- simple paracetamol combination right. uh, maybe with some uh, ppis uh, uh, definitely what i have seen it helps them okay okay all right dr nuli anybody else sir uh, no sir uh, uh, i am a practicing surgeon sir uh, when it is chronic for my this one is i should not tell to the post graduates this surgery is a bread and butter for practicing surgeons so i always go ahead with the uh, surgery option for chronic fissures acute we can wait with conservative treatment absolutely absolutely right right um any other question shall we move on to the surgeries okay mahesh i think we have a lot of good points come out with seniors yes sir yes sir go ahead Yeah, coming to types of surgeries, so uh, there are uh, uh, named surgeries of few of them. Uh, so the first one, you know, like which was practiced earlier, 
was the anal dilatation, which is a simple uh, splinter stretching, which was first described by Rasmur in 1838. But there was no standardization, and Lords took the credit for explaining thoroughly about this anal dilatation. Uh, it was initially indicated for a second degree hemorrhoid, later was found to be beneficial for uh, fissures also. Uh, but uh, later, as time passed by and uh, a lot of patients uh, came across following uh, dilatation with uh, significant uh, uh, external splinter damage leading to incontinence, this procedure uh, became uh, less, uh, uh, what do you say, like uh, less practiced and uh, it has uh, caused a lot of unacceptable high risk of fecal incontinence. So inner dilatation is uh, almost not practiced these days and its uh, uh, weightage is uh, very, very inferior to the lateral internal spintrotomy. So nowadays, uh, I don't see uh, any surgeons or uh, maximum surgeons not following this method. Uh, the most important thing is the uh, lateral internal spintrotomy, which was uh, first documented by uh, Brody in 1839. Uh, Professor Eschenemer is credited to popularize this procedure uh, of uh, lateral internal spintrotomy. It is a simple procedure dividing one half of the internal splinter in the open fashion with a radial incision, also called as the open LIS. Uh, Professor Notaras described the lateral spintrotomy, splinter also called as the closed LIS. Here, there is a small wound with a decreased rate of fecal incontinence, uh, which is reduced further. It is a simple procedure wherein a 11 number blade is introduced through the perianal skin on the lateral side and pushed upwards up to the dentate line. And when you see that you have reached up to the dentate line, the internal splinter is divided from medial to lateral side. Uh, but uh, comparing between open and closed method, there is no significant uh, difference in healing and result between them. The common complications of lateral internal spintrotomy are hemorrhage, ecchymosis around that region, hemorrhage leading to a hematoma formation, which can lead to an infected hematoma or a perianal abscess, and sometimes submucosal or interspintric fistulas, which are the most common complications of a lateral internal spintrotomy. Uh, another important surgery, which is uh, not practiced by many surgeons, but this has helped uh, many patients and I've seen uh, Dr. Shivaram uh, operating this, uh, which is called as the anal advancement flap for chronic anal fissures, uh, which is typically a uh, subcutaneous flap with an incision made from the anal verge, which is extended caudally. The skin flap is uh, advanced into the anal canal and positioned to cover the fissure and suture. Uh, usually helpful for the patients with uh, low pressure fissures, especially the group which we were talking, that is uh, the post or bad ophitic history, elderly people. This will help uh, in uh, causing less damage to the splinter and at the same time, relieving the symptoms. Uh, the latest modality uh, armamentarium in our uh, spintrotomy surgery is the laser lateral spintrotomy, which is the uh, emerging newer method for treating fissures. It is similar to a closed uh, lateral internal spintrotomy. In an experienced hand, the results are equally good. It is, can be done as a daycare procedure. The rare complications involved in this are similar to the oh, uh, scalpel method that is hematoma and infections but in a experienced hand the results are very good and I've seen they are very comfortable with the no extra wound uh, for the fissure surgery. Uh, some recent advances uh, apart from surgery which are emerging uh, for uh, treatment of fissure or uh, sildenafil cream is also uh, being tried wherein the anal resting tone of the patient with anal fissure will reduce within the three minutes of application, but it is not available commercially. It is just like a, it's still in the experimental uh, study. Potassium channel opener, such as minoxidil, also relaxes the internal splinter, but it's under research only. There is one more study which has evaluated the potential of transcutaneous electrical posterior tibial nerve stimulation versus lateral internal splintrotomy as a definitive treatment for chronic anal fissure 
But again, here also the surgical spintrotomy is superior to the uh, stimulation method. Uh, there is one more pilot study going on wherein autologous adipose tissue transplant helps in healing of the fissure in 75% and resolution of angle stenosis in patients who have failed medical and surgical therapy. Uh, any questions, sir? Yes, Mahesh. I think uh, this is very, very important to discuss a little more. Okay, postgraduate, I, I think I should clarify Dr. Sheena's question. Yeah, if 90% of the continence is contributed by the internal sphincter, your understanding is wrong. It's not <laughs> continence. What Dr. Ravishankar said is anal tone. Okay, basal anal tone. Continence is mainly by the external sphincter. Dr. Ravishankar, you want to explain to Dr. Sheena? Sheena, the the thing is the resting anal sphincter tone which helps majority of the continence is by internal sphincter but, but I, I think it is 90 10 correctly but the thing is here we are the sphincter sphincterotomy is only done in patients whose anal sphincter tone is very high and we are only cutting about uh, two-thirds of the sphincter so we are not cutting the entire sphincter so it is not going to uh, affect the continence of the patient Followed? Yeah, incontinence is mainly produced because of the damage to the external anal sphincter. All right, uh, Dr. Sheena, you have to get clarified this one. Dr. Sheena? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Cleared? No doubts? Right. Um, okay. Dr. Mahesh, I think uh, when you explained, we should have discussed a little bit about EUA because most of these patients you are not able to examine properly in the OPD. So most of the anal fissure when we do a surgery, we say that do a good examination yes, and anesthesia. Yes, sir. Very true. Yes, sir. Postgraduates, so what is what are the components of EUA? Indraja, you do every day EUA in the OT. Not there. Who else? Hari, come on, man. Hari. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, sir, proper examination done under anesthesia. Uh, before that, we have to uh, uh, do another. I mean, after anesthesia, for rectal examination, proctoscopy examination has to be done. So that is an integral part of EUA. And uh, any extra uh, problem that we face other than physiotomy, we should uh, we can take a uh, better look, sir, and uh, uh, which we can plan for uh, starting out of them. Right. I think you have told, but this is an opportunity for you to exclude any other problems. There may be an abscess or any other thing because patient has very painful. So do a proper inspection first, confirm that it is the fissure, then palpate around the anus. So inspection, palpation for any induration, for any abscess occurring there, or there may be sometimes the submucous abscess, then do a digital examination, then do a proctoscopy. So digital examination, you can go as high as possible because patient is under anesthesia. So if there are any growths or anything and see all the lateral wall, both right and left and also anterior and posterior. So this is very, very important to do a good examination under anesthesia. Otherwise, a lot of patients we have seen where Patient has undergone fissurectomy or lateral sphincterotomy, not fissurectomy, lateral sphincterotomy, but they come back with some other problem later. So it's very, very important to take this opportunity to do a good EUA before doing lateral anal sphincterotomy. Uh, okay, sir. Dr. Ravishankar, you have some points. Shuram. Yeah. Ah, really, I'll go. Uh, Shuram. 
Yeah, yeah. I I wanted to have one clarification because it was mentioned in the presentation. Now you were doing uh, the anal advancement uh, flap. Right. Uh, so I wanted to know: is it uh, is it combined with uh, excision of the fissure that is fissurectomy and doing sphincterotomy in the same wound and then doing the advancement flap, or what exactly you do in the case? See, this is not a routine practice, uh, Dr. Elgachin. There are a lot of patients, especially female, yeah. they have chronic fissure, but the anal tone is normal. And if you do a lateral sphincterotomy on them, they may develop uh, incontinence at a later stage. Such patients, but they okay. will feel better and the fissure needs to be healed because it's a chronic thing. So you can freshen the edges and cover that wound, which is a chronic wound, with the anal advancement flap. And once the skin and the mucosa is covered over that, this fissure heals and patient gets benefit of fissure treatment. So this is maybe in a small percentage of cases we do and uh, the results are very good because you are not touching the sphincter and these patients do not have the chronic uh, spasm of the sphincter or anal stenosis or anything. Their main problem is because of uh, this chronic fissure, because of their angulation, everything, it is not healing. And this procedure gives a good relief, Dr. Elgachi. Means that is without doing sphincterotomy in the same area, without doing that, without doing. Without doing sphincterotomy, yeah. Without doing sphincterotomy. And sometimes uh, there are very large uh, fissures and uh, the wound healing, if you just don't do anything, it may take longer time. And there is a sp spasm also the, of the sphincter. Such cases, I do lateral sphincterotomy and also advancement covering of the uh, fissure with the mucosa or the skin. Those, these are all very small number of cases. But uh, this heal healing is very good with proper mucosal advancement of the cover over the chronic fissure. Um, okay. Uh, one, uh, just... Yeah, yeah. Please go on. Yes, I'll go to Yeah. Uh, uh, because postgraduates, post uh, uh, many times, uh, either uh, they are just like uh, allowed for doing this procedure, maybe with supervision or without supervision, but my insisting upon uh, under supervision, provision yes. because many times uh, even um, like a junior consultants uh, they have a difficulty in getting or finding out what exactly sphincter. where exactly is the internal sphincter so to catch hold of that internal sphincter also sometimes there may be difficulty and in the bargain uh, I, I have seen many times they will go on increasing the size of the wound yes, so it is uh, better we should uh, show mm -hmm. the post graduates while doing this procedure how exactly it looks like what is the method of catching that internal sphincter and how much internal sphincter to be cut? So if you show them and make them to do some cases under our supervision, probably that will definitely boost them for doing the procedure and they will have good results once uh, they start doing practice. Shivaram, can I come in? One, one minute. Background noise. Take care of that. Dr. Shivaram, can I come in? You come in, uh, Dr. Ravi Shankar, Dr. Yes. Vasita, mute others. Yeah, please. So, the, the advancing on the advice given by Dr. Gurushantapa, mm -hmm. Professor Gurushantapa, I think my, my this one, I, from what I do and what I've seen my, my teachers do in Manchester and other places, we put a, a, a speculum and gently stretch the internal sphincter. When the sphincter is taut, it is easy to palpate and then you can also see the dentate line and then you make a cut usually at the three o'clock position and then identify the sphincter and don't cut all the way up to the dentate line but stop short of that so that way you can ensure that you have done the sphincterotomy but you know you're not going to give them incontinence so that is the method i usually follow right right uh, different yeah stretching is uh, important to identify the internal sphincter uh, yes Please. Sir, there is a well-defined groove felt in between the uh, both sphincters, internal and uh, external sphincter. That groove has to be felt by yeah. the pulp of yeah. the index finger. Yeah. 
that is that is a very good demarcation the, the guru is usually always felt in chronic uh, uh, fissure in eno yeah. my question to mahesh was what is fissurectomy yeah i am coming to that sir like uh, okay. Th- okay. There, there is a slide on that yeah okay mahesh one more question i had the between sir. the closed and open sphincterotomies you said the results are equally good Yes, but sir. are there any ex, you know ex, uh, complications like hematoma and abscess with the closed sphincterotomy because you may not see the bleeding because it may yes, happen sir. it may have like a trickle and then it may collect 10 ml 15 ml and that can get infected later yeah the occurrence is almost similar yes the identification can get delayed sir actually but uh, various studies implicate that uh, there is no much of a difference in healing and the complication rate yeah okay Okay, this question to postgraduates: Why lateral sphincterotomy? Why not anterior or posterior sphincterotomy? Anybody? Vanita. Sir, one thing is uh, anterior and posterior uh, places are the most common sites for fissures, sir. Okay. So if we do internal sphincterectomy, there it it forms a defect in uh, internal sphincter, sir. Right. Which is difficult to heal. And the one more thing is uh, this: this can be said as uh, ischemic region, sir, because of which uh, it might get delayed to heal. Sir. Correct. I think you are right. Compared to later. Yeah. Healing will be difficult. Also, many times it forms a buttonhole type of deformity in that area. so that wound may never heal but if you do a lateral sphincterotomy that area gets relaxed the healing is faster and also vascularity point what you said is correct any other opinion dr elgachin yeah what she said uh, yes yes uh, that is the reason uh, but it depends on the wound coming in the way of wound healing depends on the size of the fissure Uh, if it is a small it's all right if it is a big it may come in the way it is better to have a lateral sphincter uh, with whatever the explanation is correct correct uh, dr sriram <clears throat> you have a point about uh, sits box dr sriram can you come in uh, sir i'm just asking about the duration recommended what we should give for the patient advise the patient and also should we add beta densers uh, question yeah there is uh, no uh, evidence uh, for adding any uh, chemicals uh, the water should be lukewarm as i mentioned around 40 degrees centigrade wherein the anal muscle tone will be relaxed uh, if it is uh, around 5 degree or 23 degrees centigrade there is no much effect on the splinter uh, you know integrity so uh, recommended is uh, lukewarm water around the temperature of 40 degrees centigrade for 15 to 20 minutes each time so twice a day each time yeah uh, it is recommended two to three times or as a convenient for the patient is sir actually okay all right go ahead mahesh uh, yeah uh, coming to fissurectomy what dr nuli sir was asking uh, fissurectomy is another type of surgery which is uh, practiced for uh, uh, usually the chronic uh, fissures it is excision of uh, chronic granulation tissue in the fissure and also the hypertrophic papillae and the scar it can be left open or closed but its uh, uh, strength is uh, inferior to the lateral internal sphincterotomy it does not improve healing much and sometimes there can be unnecessary risk of incontinence uh, another uh, procedure which involves is is fissurectomy along with sphincterotomy it is the division of transverse fibers of the internal fibers in the floor of the fissure along with excision of the sentinel file this also as mentioned earlier takes a longer time to heal and is uh, reserved exclusively for chronic or recurrent fissures now and uh, nowadays it is not practiced much compared to the lateral internal sphincterotomy uh, so now that we have uh, Uh, dealt with uh, treatment both medical and surgical uh, coming to the sequelae of a fissure so what a fissure can happen uh, if treated or untreated so they can an acute one can turn into chronic uh, there can be a recurrent fissure after a conservative 
treatment, there can be resistant fissures, which may not heal in spite of medical as well as surgical treatment. They can get infected, leading to an abscess formation, leading to a fistula formation, which I mentioned earlier, like a transpentric or a submucosal fistula formation. This is how a fissure can present uh, or lead to these problems as time passed by. Yeah. Uh, before I summarize, uh, uh, can I take any questions, sir? Yeah. Anybody has any questions? Right. Fisherectomy these days, uh, not many are practicing, sir. I don't think anybody practices. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. Noli, sir, about. Uh, no, sir. Uh, my only thing to the postgraduate, sir, my one caution, you were talking about examination under anesthesia. Right, right. Examination under anesthesia is for just examination only. Never, never attempt to do any procedure because it is usually a short anesthesia they have given. We have seen many deaths also, sir. Uh, while uh, doing these uh, examinations. Don't do any any extra thing there. Just come out, then under either spinal anesthesia or full general anesthesia, we have to do these procedures because cardiac arrest can happen. So you have to be very gentle, very cautious, and usually we take them at the end of the list of surgery. So we have to, this examination under anesthesia should not be taken lightly. That was my, yes, this I wanted to tell, sir. But that concept of uh, short GA has gone, sir, now. If it is general anesthesia, it is general anesthesia. There is nothing ah, called short general anesthesia. Good, sir. Good, good. It's all... Usually, yeah. And... Uh, Usually, either they give pentothal or uh, this one, you know, so short GA, like that. Those are all yeah, shortcuts, sir. That's not practice, not safe at all. Not safe good. at all. Yes. Not safe. Good, good, yeah, yeah. Thank you. What the sh Shuram? Yes, yes. Dr. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. See, the thing is that when we are talking about fissurectomy, you see, I had a come across two patients who underwent surgery for a fissure. Later, they turned out to be a carcinoma, you know, canal. So, you know what? I think last two years, I had two patients. Right. So, should they go ahead and do a fissurectomy and send for a biopsy or should be suspicious only? Should we go and do this? What, uh, you know? I was wondering. Yeah. Mahesh? So, uh, yes, sir. Uh, so as a differential diagnosis of renal fissure, these are the common things. And first thing, especially in a elderly patient, suspicion of uh, carcinoma is to be made. Uh, so the cause for uh, fissure could be the, you know, like the, the major uh, diagnosis should be the carcinoma itself. Uh, I don't see any papers recommending to proceed with a spintrotomy and then do biopsy. It is better to just to do the biopsy and come out and uh, lay, you know, treat the fissure or the problem with a, you know, symptomatically. Dr. Mayesh, you know what, when you said the older people know, in fact, these two people were the young ladies between 20 to 30 and the one is married, the other one is unmarried girls. Oh. So later we did an APR and uh, you know what, uh, it's almost... Uh, so just three or four weeks after the fissure, I mean, surgery for the fissure later, they turn out to be a this thing, malignancy in the anal canal. No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Raj Gopal Shanae famous uh, quote is, except hair and nail, whatever you remove from the body, you send it for biopsy. <laughs> so even hemorrhoids, even sentinel pile, we sentinel practice, pile. Uh, we always send it for biopsy, sir. We know may not the malignancy may not be there, but whatever we remove, from this area, need to be sent to the histopathologist. Histopathology. Yes, sir. True, sir. Very true. So, hair, sure, um, nail. Hair and nail. Even nail also sometimes you have to send, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sir. Uh, Shuram. Yes, yes. Yeah, can I just uh, two points I wanted to, shall I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. please. I'll go to okay. Uh, uh, see about uh, the specific diseases uh, uh, which can mimic uh, like a fissure and uh, both in appearance and symptomatology. Yes. Uh, two things uh, we should remember. One is malignancy, what Dr. Hanmantai mentioned. Uh, second is Crohn's disease uh, involving the anal region. Uh, so both uh, things, if we can have a, even a clinical OPD good examination, uh, probably a consultant will be able to suspect at least. Uh, finally, you have to confirm by doing a biopsy, at least we can suspect. And in a teaching institute, most often we send the postgraduate to examine the ENS whenever the patient comes with this history. 
but if the decision is a surgical decision always i make it a point that whether the patient was examined by a consultant or not before posting the case it is not a just post graduate examining the patient and putting in the list for the ot and you get a surprise on table when you examine the perineum under anesthesia so this policy should be made a strict rule in the unit or in the department where every consultant should examine even for a minor case of fissure in you know before we take the patient on table absolutely without examining no surgeon should post the patient for surgery right the patient yeah how can anybody post for surgery without examining the patient doing a pr that should not be yeah sometimes it happens some more so in a government institute where our junior staff probably they say yes i it's all right it is fisher post tomorrow yeah because next day or next day will be minor ot list and just we'll see and uh, we'll be called senior people will be called on table in front of uh, anesthesia people and we'll see surprises in the perineum it, it do happen uh, uh, which uh, i think yes. uh, not a uh, nice way Correct. Yes, yes, sir. Well taken, sir. Right. So there is a saying I think in uh, Bailey and Love only: if you don't put your finger <laughs> into the rectum, you will put your foot into. I mean, that's something like that. So if you don't examine the, you, you may you may have to put your foot. Foot. You may have to put your foot. Correct. Don't put the finger. Correct. So it's always said, yeah. Uh, Mahesh, one thing you didn't uh, come out is uh, prevention of fissure. What are the things you tell your patients to prevent fissure in future? If it has healed, what care they should take to prevent future fissure occurring? I think this is a very important point. Yeah, uh, most importantly, one is uh, thorough counselling and. Uh... Uh, lifestyle modification to encourage uh, uh, having healthy food habits and uh, uh, physical activities if they are obese to reduce weight to improve their physical activities and to have their meal on proper time avoid junk food and oily food and uh, practice uh, you know uh, consuming uh, uh, adequate quantity of water and these advices would uh, prevent Uh, for formation of fissures for you know any patients and uh, also to uh, not to go for uh, inadvertent treatments to always visit a, a qualified physician when, when there is any uh, symptom in the ans right i think you came out most of the thing but most important is they should have should not have constipation and they should have easy motion daily yes So this is all right. Yeah. Dr. Gurushantappa is asking role of, uh, yeah, levosulfide or levosulfides. Yeah, prokinetics. I have not come across, uh, Dr. Mahesh. You have read. Uh, I have not come across, but of late uh, there are some drugs which helps in the motility of the. uh distal uh, colon like uh, proloid uh, uh, substances like that especially in the elderly uh, which can uh, prevent uh, uh, problems like fissures and hemorrhoids uh, they have found uh, some benefits with these drugs but not much of a uh, you know experience sir that is to prevent constipation and have better evacuation evacuation which indirectly can prevent uh, formation of fissures and hemorrhoids okay 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 right go ahead yeah to summarize the presentation uh, anal fissures are the very common with pathophysiological association with elevated sphincter pressure correct diagnose correctly diag- correctly diagnosing the problem and to rule out the other common causes conservative measures uh, help in healing up to 70% of the patients like already mentioned high fiber diet uh, sits path and topical uh, Uh, diltezem or topical nitrates help in majority of the patients uh, with all the studies and papers the gold standard is the limited lateral internal sphincterotomy uh, fecal incontinence is limited and transit with uh, this procedure uh, low pressure in uh, dealing with uh, low present fissures uh, anal monometry and a transit ultrasound uh, is a must before uh, attempting for surgery 
Anal advancement flap should be considered in low pressure fissures. In an experienced side, they do give good results. As I mentioned earlier, a thorough counseling during, before, and after surgery is mandatory to have a, a good result of uh, uh, healing from fissure. Thank you, sir. And this presentation. Right. Thank you. You can stop sharing, uh, Mahesh. Yes, sir. Right. Postgraduates, any questions you have? Everything answered? Anything not answered? If there are no questions, then uh, Dr. Nooli, sir. Sir, all these hemorrhoidectomy patients, uh, how often all of you do internal sphincterotomy? Hemorrhoidectomy, post hemorrhoidic. I mean, after the hemorrhoid. Should we do, go ahead with do sphincterotomy also? Mahesh? Yes, sir. Uh, I can answer this question. Uh, with my experience, uh, younger patients who present with uh, grade 3, grade 4 hemorrhoids, with whom I feel that, you know, they have a tight splinter. I uh, commonly do a splinterotomy for these patients. Uh, but uh, patients above uh, 45 to 50 years above, I don't do a splinterotomy during hemorrhoidectomy. Yeah, if there's a splinter spasm, I think it's justified, sir. Otherwise, if there's a normal splinter, not uh, tight or anything, it may create trouble. Yeah, especially I avoid in elderly patient. I don't attempt to do that, sir. Yeah. Right, right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you. Uh, sure. Dr. Shumar, to, to add to Dr. Nooli's, it's a, a good question. Uh, there are many, many articles now have come up uh, combining uh, lateral sphincterotomy during hemorrhoidectomy. Uh, definitely, it has got an advantage. Like it is mentioned, it is more advantageous if it is done in a younger uh, patient so where the tone of the uh, sphincter is very high. Uh, in fact, in the recent, we have given this uh, topic to one of our postgraduate also, right. uh, doing concurrent uh, lateral sphincterotomy during hemorrhoidectomy. Uh, now, uh, recently, I have started practicing this. Uh, definitely, it helps. Post-operative pain is less. It yes, helps in wound healing, and uh, uh, probably the recurrence uh, may be less. Uh, there are a good number of articles in the literature. Yes, but if the anal tone is less, it should not be practiced. Correct. Correct. Yes, sir. All right. Prashadapa, your concluding remarks. I think we have spent a lot of time. Presentation is okay. Uh, it was, yeah, it was nicely, nicely presented. It was nicely presented. Uh, we could get a lot of information and there are some practical uh, points of discussion. And uh, my request to postgraduate, not many are there in the in the participant list, but uh, even then uh, um, they should practice in such a way that they don't miss out the malignancies and a specific disease like tuberculosis and Crohn's. And uh, uh, nicely done spintrotomy definitely will give uh, excellent results so that yes, that sir. particular patient will not be shifted to some other consultant for his persistent problems. Uh, so overall, uh, yeah, good information. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Dr. Noli, sir. Sir, very nice presentation. Thank you, Dr. Mahesh. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the input, sir. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Hanmantaya. Yes, uh, congratulations, Mahesh. It's, in fact, it's an in detail presentation. You know, a lot of points you could able to uh, pick up by doing this. Uh, I think it's a quite a very good presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, Dr. Mahesh, you did a very good job. <laughs> lot of information. Uh, I think it's very common problem. Many times it is uh, mismanaged. Patients suffer yes, if you don't do a proper treatment. So it's very, very important for postgraduates to clearly understand this condition because a lot of patients come with fissure. And when you start practicing, it has to be done properly and the patient yes, benefit. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Sir, good night.